Good morning, everyone. It is still morning, yeah? All right, so uh, names in Dando. I'm about to have a, you know, do a talk on cloud security, securing a core banking system in AWS. I don't know if I should kick it off or let people settle in, or but I'm going to start it off, actually, just to, just to get the ball rolling. All right, so like any other talk, the best place to start is just to give you a little bit about me. And yeah, so ComSci graduate, who's pretty much just a family guy, you know, wife and a kid. Actually, I got married last week, so yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm shackled down now. Um, yeah, I'm a chess enthusiast. I actually participated in the world's first chess.com world championship, and I sucked. I, I didn't make it past the open qualifiers, but I will try again next year. Um, before I move on from chess, actually, this year was a good year for chess, you know. As I said, chess.com open world championships, but also uh, Magnus Carlsen and the whole butt plug thing. No? You guys, you guys know nothing about it? <laughs> Yeah, uh, for anybody who doesn't know anything about it, just have a chuckle and look at a video or two about that. Yeah, so I spend most of my days, you know, Jason, the gentleman who did the previous talk, I think, Mr. Spencer, he spends most of his days breaking in. I spend most of my days keeping him up. Um, so I'm on the blue side of things. And yeah, another interesting thing about me, I'm an open source evangelist. So if you give me proprietary software side by side with open source software. I'll almost always choose the open source. So yeah, humor me. Um, just want to get to know a little bit about the crowd, the audience. Uh, please do humor me and participate in this. Hands up if you regularly work inside or work in AWS. Okay, keep your hands up, don't take them down. Hands up, or keep your hands up and take your hands down. Keep them up if you use Kubernetes regularly. Nice. Keep your hands up still if you've deployed a core banking system in Kubernetes. I like that. <laughs> nice. I like that. That's pretty cool. It's actually quite crazy. Were you at Hexcon? Not. It's, it's always one guy in the audience that ends up keeping his hand up through the whole questions. Okay, so about the talk. Yeah, we're going to be just discussing, you know, like I said initially, the security of the cloud, which I think is a very important topic. And just to set the problem statement, I've got two slides that will kind of show how important this is and why we need to take this seriously. The first slide, I'm not going to go through all those points. You can read them for yourselves. The first slide just shows that 10% of the world's IT infrastructure has migrated to the cloud. Now, that's not such a big number, right? Yeah, 10%, who cares, you know? But juxtapose that with this next slide, which says cloud security breaches have surpassed on-prem breaches for the first time. Research done by Verizon, 2021, tail end of 2021. How is it that 10% of the world's infrastructure is being breached more than the other 90%. That's a big, that's, those are two big facts there. So, so for people like me, you, the blue teamers, even the red teamers, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna take anything away from the importance of what you do. We need to take this seriously, you know? Um, <clears throat> because you don't wanna be another Facebook, you don't wanna be another LinkedIn, you know? You hear it all the time, another one got hacked today, blah, blah, blah. But it's up to us to keep that from happening. And hence, topics like this, just to spread the awareness, spread the knowledge. All right, so that's that. Let's jump into this. AWS, humble origins. I think way back when started off as just a collection of, you know, simple storage service, which is still currently its flagship, EC2, the compute service. Um, and that's still today those two services comprise most of what we use AWS for. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to talk too much on AWS for now. I want to pivot away and just kind of discuss the core banking system for a little bit. On the left, we have a gentleman that I 
you know, I look up to this guy. I revere this guy, actually. Dr. Mohammed Yunus. He is a Nobel Peace Prizing holding gentleman, highly esteemed gentleman. Uh, for those of you who know in the audience, he's also known as the father of microfinance or microcredit. So just to quickly sprint through like what he's done here and just the origins of, of Finrac CN, Finrac Cloud Native. Um, the gentleman started a Grameen Bank uh, and then went on to start the Grameen Foundation in addition to other Grameen you know, subsidiaries, Grameen and, 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 and. During the period of around 2004 and 2007, and before I, before I go on, what I love about Grameen Bank and what speaks to me on this slide is the fact that, you know, look at the title. It says, Bank for the Poor. And that speaks to financial inclusivity. Being on the African continent, that really touches a chord in my heart, you know. So, so the origins of Finerac CN, so to speak, kind of seep through, you know, the, the code speaks to this, this motto, this vision, this mission statement. So, yeah. 2004 and 2007, there was like a, a burst in, in commercial activity in the bank. It grew quite substantially. And during that period, they began working on Finerac CN under the umbrella of MyFOS X. That got handed over, the MyFOS X project got handed over to the Grameen Foundation under the MyFOS initiative, which then handed the project over under the Finerac incubator program in 2011. It then subsequently graduated as a top level program in 2017. Now that's a major nod of approval from Apache. Just speaks to the maturity of the software. And, and then somewhere in the mix there, Finerac CN came out. Finerac, MyFOS X is a monolith, and then they broke that down into microservices in order to make it cloud ready and cloud native. All right, so let's speak a little bit more about these microservices, the building blocks of this core banking system. So if you have a look there, what we have is a set of services at the bottom under, so you have, you know, member administration, which, uh, and then you have membership notifications, verify ID, Finerac services, including office, provisioner, accounting, deposit, uh, and, and customer. One of the more important microservices in this diagram is the identity microservice, which is the authentication server for Finerac CN, which is underpinned by a system called Anubis. But as you can see, very simple diagram coming in from the left from the front end, hitting the gateway and then going through to the microservices where finally information is stored in the data store. Another picture describing the same thing, but differently. We have all the microservices <coughs> and, uh, and your NoSQL and SQL, Cassandra and Postgres respectively, storing all the data. All right, so just as an FYI to those who actually want to go and check the software out, the software is quite, I wouldn't say limited, but it does what it's supposed to do. But if you have to bring the software into your own context, you know, you have to build upon it and expand upon it. And this is kind of a slide that speaks to that, where you had additional microservices that worked in tandem with that set of core banking systems in order to expand upon for the context in which that software runs. Member administration, notifications, and Verify ID. For those of you who don't know Verify ID, it's a real-time interface into the natural person's registry, which is just home affairs, allowing you to verify in real time, you know, whether someone is who they say they are, and that's for the, you know, KYC process, for those of you who are in banking. All right. Okay, so I don't want to belabor too much the point on, on Finerac CN, so we'll move on from there and begin jumping into, you know, more of the uh, architectural level discussion, kind of dissecting um, the system in the greater context. Um, no cloud talk is complete without a short description of the shared responsibility model. And the catchphrase goes, AWS or your cloud service provider is responsible for security of the cloud. And we as analysts and engineers are responsible for security in the cloud. 
this this you know concept comes in later on when we're kind of unpacking the Kubernetes side of things as well. But it permeates almost every aspect of your interaction with AWS. So over here, we have that in a more, you know, a tangible view. At the bottom, you've got your, you know, AWS services, your regions, your AZs, your availability zones, your, your compute and storage, you know, S3, EBS, etc., and your networking, VPCs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which allow whatever workflows you're putting on AWS to achieve your business objectives. And then at the top, that's where we're responsible for security. And, uh, you know, whether it's security, encryption of data at rest, encryption of data in transit, configuration of those systems, we play at the top, AWS plays at the bottom. Another kind of diagram that shows this, but with a little bit more context-specific information is this one, which shows our core banking system. I don't know if this is really legible for your reading, guys, but I, am apologize. I apologize, I can't zoom in, unfortunately. So we have the core banking system. We've got the member administration, couple of, you know, the gravity gateway, et cetera, et cetera. Everything above the foundational services is for us to configure. And then everything below is for AWS to, to, to worry about. All right, now, this brings me to what I call the golden thread. I've just quickly had a brief sprint through the architectural aspects of the system that we'll be kind of discussing. And now the golden thread of what I call the security landscape in AWS. You see on the left, you've got IAM, you've got single sign-on, you know, and then you've got CloudWatch, Inspector, et cetera, et cetera. What we're going to be doing as we go along is we're going to be ticking boxes off on this landscape as we go through each section and try hit as many boxes as we can in order to ensure a secure environment. Again, not very legible, but I will zoom in this time for you. This is, you know, I would say a very basic architectural diagram. You guys have seen far more complex diagrams, and, uh, but this just serves a purpose, just to emphasize what I was speaking about in terms of the, the golden thread that I showed you just now. So you see, traffic coming in from the corporate offices via the VPN. You also see traffic coming in from the internet into the uh, environment. Most importantly, I want to bring your attention to the first thing that the end user hits, which is a load balancer that's associated to a WAF and has a, a cert attached to it for encryption of, uh, of traffic in transit via the AWS certificate manager. Again, very, very basic public subnet, private subnet, nothing complex, but just emphasizing a point here. And if we go a little bit further, we see at the back, we've got our EKS cluster with an auto scaling group that, you know, spins up nodes or spins them down accordingly. And then right at the bottom, we've got our CI CD pipeline that's, you know, got version control and Jenkins, you know, speaking to each other. So now, if you, if you were paying attention to the golden thread previously, we see we're already starting to tick a couple of boxes. <laughs> we see the WAF being ticked off. We've got a VPC being ticked off. Cert Manager, VPN, AWS Shield. So already, you know, the security of your infrastructure starts architecturally. And that's the, that's the, that's the idea here, to say, let's design a secure infrastructure before you even touch a line of code before you even configure a single service, you know? All right, so this brings me to the section on securing the stack. So in this section, I'm actually gonna, there's a nice, there's a nice way to think about securing the cloud, four Cs, right? Securing the cloud, no matter what cloud service provider you're using, um, which is the slide we just came from. Securing the cluster, securing the container, that's from a Kubernetes perspective, and then securing the code, the four Cs. So we're gonna start off with securing the cloud. The previous slide and the next upcoming slide will speak to that as well. And uh, let's just jump straight into it. So 
hands up for anybody who has ever worked with the control tower or deployed a landing zone. Nice, nice. All right, so um, just a way to explain this. Uh, a, a control tower is a way to provision a multi-account environment, right, for AWS. Now, what that does for me, the, the, the best way to think about it is you wouldn't want to put, you know, an FTP server, mail server, DNS server all in one box. It becomes too much of a, a risk in terms of the number of services that you're exposing on it. This is a similar concept. You're trying to split up multiple different aspects of your environment into logically separate areas, logically separate accounts. So you know in security we've got our core tenants, right? You've got the principle of least privilege. You've also got the principle of need to know. Think of this as the principle of separation of concerns, right? So you don't want to have one account being too high risk, that account being compromised and the whole thing going down. So yeah, let's, let's jump into dissecting exactly what this diagram shows. In the top account, the root account, we have the control tower and organizations. <laughs> control tower is just your orchestration for this multi-account landing zone. Whereas the organizations allows you to manage, it's the UI, the interface for the administrator to manage this multi-account landing zone. Coming to how we authenticate into the landing zone, we have the directory service on AWS, and then we have single sign-on. What I see most companies do, most companies that I've interacted with, actually, because, I mean, that's the, that's the AWS native version of the service. Usually, most people come in with their 365 Azure Active Directory and replace that top icon with the, with the AAD. And then, obviously, after that, the users inside that Active Directory will then use single sign-on on AWS to authenticate in. And then, this is a very, very important section in terms of the architecture that I'm showing you here. If you look, we have multiple organizational units, uh, one for you know each specific section. Um, note the asterisks on the application's OU, which just basically means you know multiple of those. So multiplicity. And you'll have, whether it's your UAT, MAT, SIT, prod, et cetera, et cetera, as, as, as many as, as you want from, from a business perspective. But right at the end, on the uh, end there, you have the SCP, the service control policies. And this is one of the key aspects to securing a uh, landing zone. Um, it is an organizational level uh, way of saying what services can and cannot do, which services are allowed and which aren't allowed. And inside each service, what can be done and what can, cannot be done. Paying attention to this is critical. All right, so going into our application accounts, maybe that's dev, prod, whatever the case may be, we again, we see service control policies, except this time on a, a per account basis. But what we also see is right at the bottom there, IAM policies. So the combination of organizational level uh, SCPs, account level SCPs, and IAM policies, that's the trifactor that really is the, the beating heart of security in an LZ, so to speak. Controlling these three is paramount to ensuring that you've got a grip and a lockdown on this LZ. All right, so moving to the networking account. Again, just speaking to how we're separating the concerns so that if one of the VPCs is compromised, not all of them are compromised, and that also means not the entire infrastructure has been taken down, giving you time to respond from an incidence response perspective before the guy pivots and takes down more of your system. So we see a couple of VPCs, egress, shared, VPC, client, v VPN, VPC. Those are quite self-explanatory. The egress VPC allowing people traffic, uh, allowing systems traffic out of the network, the shared VPC for all the OUs, hence the asterisk on it, and then the client VPN VPC allowing VPN clients to enter the, uh, the network. Okay, last but not least, we've got the audits account. The audits account is actually quite a key account because it contains 
you know, all your keys for, you know, the things that you'll be encrypting. For example, you'll have an EBS volume that requires encryption, so you'll have encryption at rest, and you will store the key to encrypt and decrypt that volume inside your KMS key store, and that key store lives inside the audit account, making this an extremely sensitive account. I've seen, I've actually seen LZ deployments where the KMS key store is taken out of the audit account and put into an account called the crypto account. However, you know, refined or granular you want to make it is up to you. But the key point, don't put the key store in other systems where, for example, your VPC resources will reside. So for those of you who've been paying attention, you'll notice these security hub and guard duty icons in every single account. And um, if we go down inside the audit account, we'll have the central guard duty and the central security hub accounts. So effectively, you're having all those guard duty, um, which is threat intelligence effectively, and security hub, which is compliance management, coming into this central account for auditors and consultants and analysts to review and act upon, those, upon that information. All right, so this is, a, I think, quite a, an important structure. If you haven't dealt with an LZ before, dig into it. It's quite important. And yeah, but let's move on. And as you can see, the golden thread, we've ticked quite a lot of the boxes in the identity and access management column. Again, I'm sorry for the legibility. And at the end there, you see control tower being ticked and you've got KMS and yeah, and VPC flow logs also being ticked there. So a couple of more boxes being ticked in our security service landscape on AWS. And it's important when you're securing an environment to bring, especially one in AWS, to bring as many of the tools that you have at your disposal to the fore against real threat actors. All right, so this brings me to this section of the talk, which um, what I would call the core security offering that is provided on AWS. So you have a combination of your guard duty, again, threat intelligence coming in from, you know, various logs, VPC flow logs, S3 API logs, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've also got your security hub, which is your compliance. In this picture, unfortunately, I forgot to include PCI. That is one of the compliance standards. I'm sure many of you actually deal with that regularly. But we've also got the AWS foundational standard and the sys compliance. All of that coming in and hooked into some sort of alert system that allows you to see these alerts as they're generated, as and when they're generated. This is the, you know, again, a very core basic model for security on AWS. So let's expand upon it. You have on your right a couple of new services. You've got Macy, <clears throat> which hunts down Poppy information. You know, it's it's so easy to to slip and miss you know, a data store or a, a repository of information that's got a lot of client data. And it, it's happened. I've seen it happen. You want the machines to help you out with that. Um, then you've got your IAM access analyzer. You know, are there outdated keys that need rotating? Are there any users that need to be removed because they haven't been access, accessed in a long time? Then you've got your SSM patch manager. Now, to be honest, SSM is, the systems manager is an amazing tool. It's more than just a patch manager. For example, recently, we had to configure a WAF, right? And, and you know, you've got a couple of EC2 instances in a client environment. You don't really know what's running on them. So we deployed an SSM agent onto these machines that kind of scrubbed the system and told us what software was installed, you know, Node, PHP, et cetera, et cetera, created an inventory of that, and then that allows us to then go back to the WAF and refine the rule set accordingly. You don't want to just throw all the rules on the WAF that really don't make sense. You know, if it's a Windows box, you don't want to put Linux rule sets, you know. So, so that's quite a, a neat feature of the, of the security manager. And actually, it goes much deeper than that, but patching is one of the big things that you want to use that for. And then you've got Inspector, which, you know, we used quite recently to, to scan for the log4 shell vulnerability across all uh, containers 
that were that were running in, in, in multiple environments. Okay, now as security consultants, defenders, attackers, you know, one thing we don't want to be doing is, is adding to the problem. You know, if you're going to be configuring a security architecture like this, you don't want to be the guy that allows the guy, the other the bad guys in. And um, S3 really is one of the ways which a lot of companies have found their pants down because of misconfigurations. All right. Now, so you might be asking me, how does this architecture fit into the previous architecture, which I just shown, which is the landing zone, right? Notice emphasized the guard duty elements of each account, and uh, you're seeing guard duty and, and, and security up here. So indeed, what you have is you've got the main audit account feeding security hub information in from all the child accounts. And that is the architecture that we'll be going for when securing the environment. All right, so that brings me to the golden thread yet again. And notice now this time um, how quite a lot of the boxes are now finally ticked off. Unfortunately, um, and Ivan, I don't know if Ivan's here, but unfortunately, this column here is something where, you know, I was at a, I was at the Hexcon conference, and, and Ivan, Ivan Birch, I think, mentioned there's such an undersupply of incidents responders in South Africa, you know, and I, I'm proving that right now. In preparation of my talk, I didn't even, I didn't even touch that 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 column there, but for the most part, you know, you're seeing the light starting to switch on across across the. The, serv the security service landscape. All right, that brings me to the end of architecturally how you would go about securing, you know, your 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 cloud environment. Let's jump into the Kubernetes environment where the code will be running. So, a couple of you guys already know Kubernetes. I kind of asked that question at the beginning. What you'll notice if you're paying attention, I'll, I will come back to this now, actually, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's just start with a brief overview of how Kubernetes is put together. So you have your API server, which is one of the more critical components in the architecture. That's what the kubectl command line application interacts with when an administrator kind of interacts with the cluster, all right? And then you've got your cloud controller manager, the icon at the top there, and then you've got your etcd. etcd being, well, before I go to etcd, Cloud Controller Manager being the API to the, you know, cloud service providers resources. And then you've got your etcd, which is a distributed high availability data store, which stores the state of the cluster. Now, compromise of either the API server or the etcd data store is akin to Root on a Linux box. So that's that's what you want to protect right at the beginning at the offset. Damn, I'm really thirsty now. So, all right, so then we've got our nodes. Recall in the previous uh, architectural diagram, the simple diagram, that we had that auto scaling group, it's actually responsible for spinning up the nodes, which are just regular EC2 instances. Um, inside those nodes, what you'll have running is the kubelet, um, and the kubelet via the container runtime interface manages the pods inside your nodes. And then you've got the kube proxy, which is the physical implementation of a service in, in Kubernetes. Now, for the eagle-eyed audience member, You'll notice there are two elements missing here. There's the regular controller manager. The controller manager, I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but has it manages controllers. One of them, if you ever want to get into Kubernetes research, one of them that you'd really want to look at is the admission controller. It, before a pod is scheduled, it will then mutate and verify certain elements of that pod or that manifests before scheduling it on a pod. And then you've got another thing that's missing here is the scheduler. The scheduler says, okay, cool. You've given me a pod. Let me find a node to run it on. And then 
and then the kublet will say okay i've got a, i've got a pod now uh, let me find a container let me put the container inside the pod so those those two systems the scheduler and the kublet work hand in hand to deploy the workflows that you'll be that you'll be using to uh to run your systems all right another view that i'd like to kind of give you is the flow of network traffic right so you've got your red line coming from the admin to the api server very very important to protect that then you've got your end user coming in through the services you know that'll be an http endpoint that they'll be interacting with and then you've got your container registry where the pod pulls its containers down from the internet from assuming it's a, it's a public container registry all right now let's discuss some of the attacker entry points i've already mentioned that you know the api server as well as the etcd server are high value targets those need protection at all costs then you'll have your service i mean anything that the end user can get to the hacker can get to as well right um and then you've got your node and your kubelet over here there's there's some actually really neat vulnerabilities out there one being a container escape vuln on the uh, CRIO runtime. Uh, most runtimes today, actually, I think the majority of, of Kubernetes clusters run on Docker, but a couple of really neat CRIO vulnerabilities out there for the vuln researchers. And then you've got your registry, which stores the images, which will end up running as containers. All right, <clears throat> so let's begin just unpacking um, you know, how each of these elements can be protected to keep, you know, the threat actor out. Before I go any further, um, for those of you who do work in the environment, you'll notice that I've kind of cheated. I've added those two blocks there. And if you're on a AWS cluster, you'll never actually see the control plane. You won't see the master node. It's invisible to you. That ties back to, you know, the shared responsibility model. That's something AWS is in charge of, you know, securing. However, that being said, there is a certain degree of control that we do have at this point here, which is control over the API server. So let's jump into that. So what you have is most of the time you wanna have a rollback system protecting that. But in this case, AWS implements that rollback system via IAM. You don't have to worry too much about that. What you can worry about, <coughs> is who has access to the API server. If you make that API server public, what you'd wanna do is, you know, whitelist certain trusted IP addresses that can access that API server. The preferred method, the recommended method, is making your API server private and then using perhaps a jump box or a transit gateway to connect to that, uh, to that, to that private API endpoint. Again, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide. But as I move on to the next slide, you'll notice I've put an X on API server. I've also put an X on etcd data store. You cannot control anything on the etcd data store. That's AWS. So hence, that was just for information purposes. All right. So the pod security policy. What you want to do is when you're running a pod, inside a node, you want to control what level of access that pod has to the underlying host, whether it's got host ports access, whether it's got host network access, et cetera, et cetera. That's done via the you know, pod security policy, as well as in combination with the network policy. I'm so sorry that this can't be read properly, but I hope I'm narrating it properly for you guys. Um, and one important thing to know about the pod security policies that for those who deal with this again regularly, this is deprecated as of version 1.21 of Kubernetes. And I think it'll be completely phased out end of life by 1.25. And then I'd like to pause for a second and have a shameless plug um, and have a little bit of a question air to see who wants these, you know, synthesis goodies. I think there's a couple of shirts in here key holders, socks, chocolate, cups, for anybody who can answer the next question for me, which is, and I'll, I'll, I'll give it to the person who gives me the most correct answer. I'm not sure if everybody's going to get it right, but it is easy. 
Um, so we're moving away from the pod security policy to protecting the registry. Anybody want to have a, sh a shot at how you protect your registry? Hands up. No? Yes, sir? Nice. Okay. That's actually... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Anybody else want to give it a shot? I mean, there's a couple of things. Maybe we split them up. Nobody. The gift's yours, man. <laughs> so a notary server, right? Signatures. But in addition to static code analyzers, and actually something very interesting a friend of mine showed me earlier on this week is chat GPT uh, in terms of secure code reviews or static code reviews. Have a look at that. But yeah. So a notary server, you'd want to, you'd want to, you know, there's two options here that you want to play with. One, you're going to go with a third party hosted notary server. The problem with that is that you're not going to have all the signatures. You know, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to take what you get. The other alternative is, you know, creating your own privately owned notary server, which then leaves you with the job of creating those signatures yourself. And then of course, you know, open source or proprietary scans of those images using a static code analyzer. All right. Okay, protecting the service. Like I said earlier on, the same way an attacker can get to the, uh, the back end, the same way an end user can get to the back end is the same way an attacker does. And how I've had success in the past is converting the service to an ingress of type Nginx and then enabling the mod security rule sets with the OWASP core rule set on there. So the mod security plugin, excuse me, with the OWASP core, core rule set. Now you might ask yourself, but Ndando, that's just the duplication of the WAF that you showed me right at the beginning. Indeed, but if you look a little bit deeper and for those who have played with Nginx, it, you know, you've got a lot of control over some of the security HTTP headers. And that gives you control over what the attacker can and cannot do. So that's a very, very cool combination there that you can use to protect the service. And then last but not least, you have the AWS resources that are sitting on the cloud, such as your EBS block, well, block storage. What you want to do here is you want to have an IAM policy attached to a service account that you force the pod to run with. So that pod cannot access what you haven't given it access to, even if it gets compromised. Right. So so that's a that's a pretty neat one to block that attack vector as well. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Okay, looks like I'm good. So yeah, um and that brings me to the end guys of you know securing Kubernetes, which also means it's the end of the stack. I did say that there are four C's. I'm not a coder, so I'm not gonna lie and stand here and tell you about how to secure the code. You know, I'll tell you about how to secure the infrastructure, but I do know that secure code reviews does get you a long way. Again, I'll name drop that, that, that thing again, chat GPT, check it out. In terms of, you know, the feature of secure code reviews. But yeah, that's the, uh, that's the end of what I have to show you. Basically, I think the, the take home here for me, and I hope this is what you're taking home, is, you know, a multi-layered approach to security, which is the, you know, which is the standard. You start off with securing the cloud, the cluster, the container. And at each level, you want to you wanna observe certain core tenets of security, like the security, uh, the principle of separation of concerns, which we saw in the LZ, and uh, the, the principle of least privilege, which we'll see when we're associating a policy to a service account. But other than that, that's all she wrote, guys. That's all she wrote. Uh, thank you for your time. Do we have any questions? Awesome. <laughs> Go for it, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually an interesting question. We've been working on 40s 
very recently for east west north south traffic inspection on aws so yeah it's, it's something that i'm coming up across in the real world and yeah you point out a good point the fact that i don't have it in my slides but it is something that you'd want to look at but yeah i think next time around with version two of these slides i'll, I'll add it in there thanks so much 100 percent. thank you Nice. Thanks. Were you going to ask something? Yeah. So, actually, no, because we, we found we found it difficult to get guard duty into Kubernetes, so we ended up using, you know, open up proprietary software, which I don't like, to always lean on we use prisma specifically twist lock kind of to to gain to gain insight into into the cluster yeah 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 yeah. Okay. So there was a trend micro conference that we just recently attended with the team. And so instance metadata service version two, IMDS V2, right? There's a couple of server side request forgery attacks that can go on it. And we got that feedback from guard duty in the island region. So we're sitting there trying to secure this cluster from this IMDS V2 attack. And we're noticing, wait, hold on. AF South doesn't scan for that finding. So there was an AWS representative at the Trend Micro conference, and I'm saying to him, so you're saying South African security admins have to fight this fight with their hands tied behind our backs. And, and then he just like, oh, yeah, okay, okay, I'll get back to you, you know? And, and, but it was a valid question because you're running scans in Ireland, which pick up this very bad vulnerability, same scans in Cape Town, the, the Cape Town region, do not. What does that mean for people like us who have to protect information that resides in South Africa because government wants the information for our citizens to stay here, poppy, right? So yeah, so that's a, that's a big one. That's a very, very big one. I don't know if I answered your question or if I went on a tangent there. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100%. I've, I've seen them. I've seen them in, in practice, and I'm speaking to AWS, and I'm telling them, your shit is gawk, fix it. You know, and, and yeah, they're, they're trying. They're trying, I guess. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. 100%. I agree with you, man. I agree with you. Any other questions? Oh, God damn it. <laughs> from a yeah yeah you say falco okay cool is that a service mesh type of okay okay Thanks, I'll remember that. Falco. Falco, thanks. I'll remember that, man. Thanks. Yeah. 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 So, you know how, how I'm going to answer your question is I've, I spoke to a couple of CISOs and I'm like, you know, companies getting hacked, CISOs getting sacked, 
it's a it's a shame you know when a company gets hacked and then the CISO gets sacked you know um, so the answer to to your question is how far do you want to go you can look at it from a commercial perspective you're paying more for that peace of mind and you're offloading that risk that you know you're, you're no longer responsible for if it gets hacked that's how I would look at it you know and but you you're paying premium for that for that peace of mind you know because now you're that CISO who's spending more money than you should be but you know that if somebody gets into your network you get, you get to point the finger you know so that's another way of looking at it you know yeah <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. Um so SSM is pretty cool now for that. You can you can kind of SSH into it using your browser without having to expose it. Um so you, you run the instance, you put a you put an agent on there, an SSM agent on there. And you'll be able to interact with the terminal via the browser without having to, you know, set up keys and things like that. Um, and using PuTTY or whatever to connect over the internet. Um, you'll just be, you know, HTTPing your way into that. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of, uh, without revealing too much about how we do what we do, that's, that's a good way to do it. But there are other ways to, you know, skin that cat as well. I'm running out of water, guys. I'll better wrap. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thank you so much.